Short days and cold weather make for long winters in New England, especially for fishermen itching to wet a line in open water. Thankfully, there are some special opportunities for desperate fishermen who want to beat back the cabin fever. On the Water editor, Jimmy Fee and I took advantage of a break between winter storms to visit Connecticut's famed Farmington River, a well-known fly fishing destination. There we met up with Joe DiOrio, a fishing guide who specializes in saltwater striped bass fishing, but also loves to target trout on the Farmington. Rather than our typical fly rods, our plan was to use center pin rigs and float fishing setups. Center pin fishing has quickly become a popular way to target salmon and steelhead on the Great Lake tributaries. After we rigged up our rods, we set out for a short hike to one of Joe's favorite pools for wintertime fishing. So Joe, everything has names. But what stretch of water? Bon boneyard. The boneyard. Okay. Boneyard. And where does the boneyard beginning and end? Does it? Does uh, it? Well, it really starts right at the top of the hole up there. Okay. And it will go all the way down to like the slack water down here. Here we are, March first, and we're going to get into some center pin fishing. So this is kind of new for me. What, what are we going to start? What are we going to do? So basically, what we're doing is we're center pinning. Uh, it's basically float fishing, and we're going to be fishing the seams. And there's seams and pockets, pretty much. Um, as you can see, you have the fast water over out in the middle and then you have the slack water on the inside. Basically what's happening is there's a shallow part over here and it goes down deep and then it comes back up and there's big rocks right in the middle. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna fish that seam. The water level's pretty low to be honest for this time of the year. I either like it really, really low yeah. or really, really high. Yeah. When it's really, really high, it pushes the fish to the to bank the and it really congregates them in one specific area. When it's low like this, um, it also congregates them, but it also but makes for a lot better seat. drift as well. How deep are we going to be setting this as far as the, uh, the depth? When we're float fishing, that's probably the most important thing is yeah. making sure that you have the correct depth. If you don't want to be dragging, you don't want to be too high, because if you're, if you're too high, you're not going to, it's going to be above you're your above heads. You're above the fish. Yep, and if you're too, too low, low you're it's going to be not natural. Right. The most important thing that we're going to be doing today is making the most natural drift possible. Okay, okay so we're going to try to get that egg sack out in front and the bobber, and the bobber behind it. Um, Right here, I would say it's anywhere between three and a half to four and a half feet. Up at top, it's a little bit shallower. And right under in the back of that tree, actually, it's about five, five, six feet. You know, we'll be adjusting the floats as we move down, up and down the river. Okay, one of the big questions I know we get asked all the time is, how do you set your weights? Traditionally, you could use an accelerated shot line. Okay, yeah. so what that means is you want to be heavy up top, medium in the middle, and then light on the bottom. And what that's gonna do is the top of the water is a lot fat, the current's a lot moving a lot faster than it is on the bottom. So what you wanna do is that's why we put it's really, really light on the bottom. It and kind of give yep. you an even flow all that, the way down. That, those weights up top are really gonna punch through that top of the current and it, the, the bottom end, it's gonna be lighter so it kicks everything out. Yeah. And this way you can you nice create the most natural it. drift as possible. Well, it looks like we had a beautiful day. We got great water. Yeah. Jimmy, I know you've been here a few times. How have you done so far? So I've been here <laughs> fly fishing only in the Farmington four times. I've yet to catch my first Farmington River trout. And uh, so when, when I learned that Joe was doing the center pin fishing here and he said how effective it was, I was excited to try out something different. I'm sure we're going to get them pretty good today. <laughs> When you're casting, your hand is the guide. It's just a very, very easy motion. You're starting here, you're going here, and like I said, you're keeping that line 90 degrees off of that spool. Okay. And it's gonna come right and off the top of the spool. Some people use like an O to go through the thing. I know some Andy was trying to teach yeah. me that. And some people use an O, other people use this, just the side of their hand. Whatever works best for you. All right, I'm gonna jump up ahead. Go right ahead. You're good right there. So to hook these, I'm going to go through one of the eggs just to pop it, and that's going to get some of the scent out there in the water to help uh, attract the trout. But for the most part, you want to keep the eggs intact, and you're going to want to check this every few drifts to make sure the eggs aren't white or washed out, because uh, once they are, it's not fishing effectively anymore. So you want to make sure you've got a, an egg sack that's looking good. The eggs are nice and bright orange. Always well, takes me a little bit to get used to casting these again. Perfect. You got it. 
guy's already a pro. There's an edge here where you have some faster water out toward the middle and some slower water here. And those trout are going to hang on the edge of the fast water because the fast water is going to be what brings them their food, whether it's nymphs or trout eggs. And, uh, but they're going to want to expend as little energy as possible. So they'll hang on the slow edge of the water waiting for the fast water to bring them something to eat. So I'm trying to get that float and that rig right on the edge there because that's going to be where the trout are sitting. So you get a nice fish on these. You just kind of cup your hand underneath it like that and let that be a drag. But yeah, yeah. Right but underneath. Either that or I use this hand. Yeah. I use this hand Here a we lot go. to control the uh, way the fish is. Give me tight. Running. There you go. First Farmington River fish. Not yet. <laughs> I have to not lose them yet. Looks like a brown, seeing kind of that beautiful gold to it. Fever getting it done. We have a great net that we, of course, <laughs> forgot at the office. Beautiful brown trout. Oh man. Nice. There you go. I'm just gonna... So here's the first one. Look at the colors on that fish. It's got little red spots in there. So we've got to put him back in the river. Beautiful fish. Not too bad for my first fish on the uh, on the Farmington. So that fish was on white, and it's, uh, I always think it's a little more fun when you have to dial them in a little bit. You know, started out, had to find the right depth, then messing around with the color, and then finally made it work. And I think the key right now, the fish don't seem to be holding on the close uh, edge of that fast water and slower water. They seem to be on the far side, which is where that brown was. So I'm going to try to get another cast out there and see if uh, there's a few more in there. Man, they're pretty fish in here. Yeah, right? That's pretty cool. Here, why don't we head down this way? All right. Don't have to ask me twice. We'll go low hole Jilly, uh, Jimmy. <laughs> now you have to fill us in on the lingo. What does low hole mean? We're going below the person below you and stealing their drift away from them. So that's how they, they do it on the Farmington, huh? That's the etiquette here. The best thing about today is we can low hole each other all day long. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Just don't tell my wife. <laughs> so as you can so see. So right there, as it kind of hit there, that's the place where it dropped. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. That's actually four to five feet. And I think there's one section back there that's about six feet deep. Oh, I wasn't mending it enough. Yeah, so it dropped twice in the same spot. I wasn't sure if the first one was bottom, but now I'm pretty sure it was a fish. Definitely was probably a fish. A lot of the center, spin, center pin specific rods are designed with guides. You know, you have the thinner, these are, uh, actually I think this has, this doesn't have recoil guides, but it's got thinner guides that are set further out from the blank, especially toward the tip. And that's going to minimize icing because you are doing this at, in the coldest times of the year. You know, the water temperature is mid thirties. The air temperature is colder than that. So you do deal with quite a bit of icing. And there are a couple ways to mitigate it. One way to, to uh, keep the icing to a minimum, some guys will spray Pam or, or cooking spray onto their guides and that helps. There's really no difference between, uh, you know, tackle for upstate New York and, and for here. You could use a 13 foot rod or you, you, you could use a nine foot rod. Um, I like to use a nine foot rod just because the stream's a little bit smaller, a little bit easier to cast. Some of the times we're walking through um, some highly wooded areas, so the, the smaller rod definitely makes it a lot easier. You know, with my center pin, it's spooled up with 10 pound to 12 pound maxima ultra green. A lot of guys like to use the high vis line, so this way they could see the line in the water. It goes out really easy, there's no resistance. Yeah. No, yeah, this, it's definitely very, very great line. It's really, really nice line. Uh, not a lot of memory in this line, uh, especially the ultra green. You know, when you start using other lines, a lot of them, it will have heavy memory. And especially with the center pins, you're casting off the sides, so it's making a natural line twist yeah. in the line. 
you know, I have my 12, my 10 pound test attached to a, my first swivel. Uh, that swivel is, is attached to my shot line. My shot line is anywhere between eight to six pound test. Uh, that's what the, the line that I put all my weights on. Uh, so like I said, I have- And how my, long is the length on that one? Depends on where I'm fishing. I have some spots on this river that are eight feet deep. So I'll make that line, you know, eight feet deep and then I'll put a two foot leader behind it. Uh, but most of the time, my shot line is Who's five feet now? deep. Who is back now? <laughs> you got it down now. I that's think it clicked. Sure. The last three casts, right, it's clicked. Jimmy's got. Well, that's a nice fish right there. That's a nice fish. Jimmy, still white on there, bud? Yeah, yeah. I actually increased the depth a little bit on this one. Looks Good like job. another brown, fat, fat, fat fish. Another nice thing about the long limber rods is they do will protect the leader. You kind of, that's a pretty brown. Oh yeah, that's a nice one, Jimmy. What's that, almost like 19, 20 inches? That's a beautiful fish. That's gotta be 20. Look how thick too. I mean, just a beautiful brown trout. Meat eater right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's in no rush. Nice fish. Yeah, they're definitely taking a little bit to wake up this morning. And Joe said uh, it could be a couple things. It could be the cold night and they're just uh, waiting, you know, the water temperature, even if it clicks up just a couple degrees, that could be enough to get them feeding. Or he said the thing that might have put the bite off a bit was a recent drop in the water level. So, the, you know, think of it this way. If you were sitting in your house and your ceiling dropped two feet, it would freak you out too. So that's just takes them a little bit to get, uh, to get adjusted and acclimated to the new water levels. And then they start chewing after a day or two. So well, maybe as we get deeper into the afternoon, the fishing will pick up a little bit. I'm in a great spot right there, kind of drifting down. This center pin is very new to me, and it definitely takes a little bit of time to get used to it. Sometimes, uh, you know, in low light conditions, um, in the winter time, it, it, it can affect the bite. Uh, during summertime, during springtime, fall, Low light conditions are best, uh, but this time of year, they like that sun on the water. Um, so typically that first, that first hour and the last hour sometimes aren't the best times to be fishing. Oh, 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 oh. Starting to happen, boys. Not for everyone, but. So basically what I was doing is I was fishing right along the seam right here. There's a nice little pocket where these fish have been holding very tight to shore almost. This is a stock trout, um, but you can see it's adjusted to the river um, with its markings. So these red markings, they're not stocked like that. They adjust to the river. Oh, that's how they get those colors. That's maybe 20 inches. Let's let this guy go. There he goes. I think I gotta be a little further out. No, actually, that's that's a good area. Oh, 
Oh yeah, there you go. There boat you go, time. you got him. Boat time. That's a nice fish right there. I'm holding enough for a hero, Jimmy. The weather, as you said earlier, I said, I asked you a question, you know, bright sunshine, he goes, sometimes that'll turn it on, you know, that'll turn it yeah. on. And, and uh, as this sun has warmed up, my feet have warmed up, this fishing has actually improved. Yeah, that's a beautiful fish right there, Chris. Look at the colors on that fish, huh? Oh my God. There Gorgeous. you go. That's a stocked, that's a stocked brown trout. I want to give you that. Perfect. Very similar to the last one you had. And you said earlier that this is about that 20 inch spot, you know? Yeah. Like look at the colors on that. Look at the dark brown, uh, the dark black spots. That is amazing, that, that right there. Finally broke the ice, literally broke the ice off of my guy earlier. <laughs> and uh, That's beautiful. I'm gonna get this guy go. That's a heck of a fish right there. Oh, that's fish. awesome, Joe, huh? After another hour fishing, we tied into one more brown trout before Joe signaled it was time to try a new location farther downstream. With our gear packed, we hiked the snowy trail back to the truck and then closely followed Joe to a spot he predicted would hold more hungry trout. Should we go on the other side of the bridge and back into the light or, or not that far? Um, you could go all the way to the other side of the bridge. That's fine. I go pretty much till I can't see it anymore. Yeah, okay. A little colder here. Yeah, that wind, there's a nice little wind tunnel here. Nice. That might be a rainbow. It's a good brown, huh? Rainbow. Oh, rainbow, nice. Yeah. Oh, quick on and off. Rainbow, this, yeah, huh? Yeah, nice rainbow. Yeah, this, this spot we catch a lot more rainbows because they sit in the faster water better. I take my eye off it for a second. There we go. Can, whoa. Sweet G, he's got the sweet spot. Nice. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah. I'm going over to the land of big fish. Is it uh, all about the same depth going over? Yeah, yeah, pretty much the same depth. Just the current a little stronger? Current's a tiny bit stronger. Eep. You do have, Chris, if you aim for the green parts, it's a little bit cushy. You feel like you get a good grip on it. Yep, that's good. You can go there or down further, wherever you want. As you get to the bridge, it's dipping down pretty good, is yeah, it? Yeah, it dips down to like three and a half feet. I'll hang here, you guys. Oh, you can go over there. That's right. There, there's plenty of room. Yeah, right, right, basically right in front of you. Yeah. Is like one of the sweet spots. We want to fish from start right here. Okay. Okay. And we're going to fish all the way down to where our, our bobber Into the stops. soft water. Yeah. Okay. Right around there. There we go. Nice. Is there a fish on that? Oh, yeah. Doubled up, baby. Yeah. Oh, doubled up. Sure. All right. You're nothing to see. I, I knew I moved down here at the right time. Oh, beautiful rainbows. 
right on that, right on that spot. Beautiful rainbows. We're not going to tell Jimmy about. Not that you guys would have told me, but I couldn't hear anything out there anyhow. So. <laughs> Beautiful fish. Look at that. Look at the colors on that. You know what? That could be wild. They, they didn't chop the adiposa thin. Chris, is that a brownie? Yeah, you're brown. Nice. Oh, brownie. Come on, fella. That's a nice fish. Nice. We're in them, boys, now. We're in them. Oh, so yeah. were, were you guys getting some hits before that? No, no. Who knows these things? And trying to signal me by or, or no, no? <laughs> let me that's out another. There. That's very similar to the other one. Oh. That 18, 19 inch fish stocked. That's been. Gorgeous fish, guys. You know, I was losing it under the shadow lines yeah. there in my indicator, and just coming over here gives it a different profile. A little different profile. Also, these fish are, are sitting right in that slack water. Fishing the bridge proved to be exceptionally productive. We managed to catch nearly a dozen trout on that single stretch of water. There we go. There it is. But look, that's a, that's a wild fish. Yeah, probably five, four. Four, three, two, all. Uh, you can put on the five. Oh, there you go, Chris. Yep, You're on. Yep. Oh, yeah. Look at that. He's calling it. Jimmy, I'm going to swing this guy right in front of you. Nice fish. I told you, Chris, this is our spot. This is our spot. <laughs> <laughs> Joe had one final spot in mind, just downstream a few miles. With sundown approaching, Joe managed to tie into one final big brown trout before daylight turned to dusk. Ooh. Oh my good. Yeah, that's a nice fish. For anglers itching to wet a line and beat back that cabin fever, it's worth seeking out this hidden gem in the heart of Connecticut.